ಮನುಮಾಪಿಸಿಪುತ್ರಮಧುರಾಸ್ವರೂಪಮಧಾವಸ್ವಪ್ತೋಯಶ್ರಿತ್ರೀಪಾಯ್ರಿಗುರು
like a beggar also. Bhaman Dev is a beggar. He's comes, he comes very small and in the mood of begging. So Sri Nam comes to our life in a very, very uh, unassuming, unpretentious way. I'm begging for our heart, for our attention. Yeah. Sometimes it is described that the Sri Harinam comes as a sweeper. No? Mahaprabhu says, Cheta Darpana Martanam. Sri Nam, the name has to clean the dust from the unconscious. So it's like a sweeper. So Sri Nam comes to our life like a opening a little shop selling uh, brooms. Mm -hmm. um, in the midst of all the mega corporations that we have in our own minds in the form of all our material desires. Those are like big corporations. No? And in the midst of all those big corporations, imagine like in the big, in the midst of Silicon Valley or something, someone comes, I'm opening a broom shop here. No? <laughs> it's like, oh, that guy won't be successful in this life. But somehow you can try. It's not just any broom. It's a magic broom. No, You try the magic broom once. It's for free. <laughs> Uh, and you try the magic room, and, oh, it's working. Check to that on the margin now, and so on. So gradually, that little broom shop will will prevail, so to say. And all the other mega corporations that are our material fears and misconceptions will have to call, close one after another, one after another. When all the neon lights disappear, <laughs> and only this magic broom re remains, so to say. So in that way, Krishna comes in a very unassuming way, in a very humble way, in a very small way, as a sweeper as Bhavan Dev is coming in this Leela. So that's one important point in the Bhavan Dev Leela. And of course, we are, again, we are demanded or invited to chant the name with utmost humility, Trinada, Peace, Nichina. But that's because the name comes to us first with utmost humility. So it's not like, hey, why are you demanding me Trinada, Peace, Nichina? Because the name is coming in Trinada, Peace, Nichina, Spirit. So it's just a basic reciprocal uh, invitation. The name is, <coughs> is coming... With humility, you are invited to chant the name with humility. But of course, this, this Lila of Vaman Dev and Bali Maharaj revolves a lot about the principle of Atma Nivedanam. Already you, we will see that today, and, and we, you have already seen that in part in the last classes, I'm sure, which is Atma Nivedanam means I offer myself to God. I like to translate that also as individuation. Or as radical personalism. <laughs> no, you have to offer yourself not in a generic abstract way. Here I am, a chunk of humanity offered to you, God. <laughs> but I'm a very unique and specified entity that is offered in a very personal way, radically personal way, for your pleasure. Now, Krishna doesn't like doesn't find taste and rasa in abstract generic stuff, but in uniquely specified. Personalities. He is a uniquely person, specified personality. So, so this for me has to do with with individuation, with with making making of us all that we can be as individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, and all this is the preliminary function for Braja Lila Kata Tenth Canto. So my point is, all the things have to be in place so we can actually participate in the ultimate goal we want to attain in Brindavan and in Navadim. An individuation has to be there. Atman Ibedan has to be there. Trinada peace initiative has to be there. And so, so anyhow, you know how the Lila proceeds. Eventually, Bhavan Dev appears. I'm very summarizing, of course. I won't go into the details, but Bhavan Dev appears as a dwarf, begging for these three steps of land. Uh, and Bali Maharaj offers him everything. Three steps of land is, he feels like, embarrassing to just give that. I can give you a whole planet if you want. And, and Bhavan Dev, of course, emphasize this principle of tushti, which is very important, also especially for brahmanas. He will say tushti means like to be satisfied with things that come out of their own accord. That's it. No? That's Because tushti is translated as satisfaction. But the point is many people is looking for satisfaction but being dissatisfied. No? It's like the famous song, I can get no satisfaction. <laughs> and I try and I try and I try. That's the lyric. And the guy poor is screaming up out of frustration. And everyone's like glorifying the song and singing and dancing, not realizing this person is agonizing, basically. No? That's the only thing I can say. I'm trying to look for satisfaction. I'm trying, but it's not happening. So Tushti means you have to learn to be satisfied with things as they come out of their own accord. Don't try to force reality. Don't try to push yourself into the environment more than required. 
And then comes this famous section that you already seen maybe days ago, but I would like to mention one point before going you know, in a minute to the verse, which is Bali Maharaj is totally willing to uh, give charity to Baman Dev, even when he starts to realize oh, he's part of the enemy side, so to say. No? Baman Dev is, is on the side of the Devas, Bali Maharaj is on the side of the demons, Asuras, and Sukracharya is telling, as you know, Bali Maharaj, don't do it. No, don't give charity. He's a cheater. No, he's masking as a dwarf, but he's way bigger than that, mm -hmm. so to say. But Bali Maharaj cannot, cannot go against his, his vow. I mean, he's the grandson of Prahlad Maharaj. So it is mentioned how he already at this point received enough bhakti some scars by his grandpa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So he cannot go against Bhakti, basically, let's say. The, imagine you have your grandfather is Prahlad Maharaj. I mean, you have enough Bhakti samskaras. To, you have God in front of yourself begging. You cannot go against that. So you cannot go against Bhakti. So he will reject his guru, basically. Which is an interesting idea. He rejects uh, his guru because his guru is in, instructing him go against the sweet absolute. And Prahlad is like, a guru kind of, a, guru, a real guru will never tell me that. So at that moment, the guru tattva has stopped flowing from that particular individual. We talk a little bit these days about guru tattva. So someone may be serving as a guru, as, but as long as that person is <clears throat> representing that department of guru tattva, that person is to be considered as guru. If that's not happening, I cannot surrender in that direction. Bali represents Atman Ivedana, full surrender. But when something does not represent divine will, he won't surrender there. So that's an aspect of surrender also. <laughs> no, he, in order to continue surrender in the proper direction, I won't surrender into an improper direction. Mm -hmm. So he rejects his guru, and we know eventually Bali Maharaj is considered as one of the 12 Mahajanas, or great personalities that Vatan describes, no? So I, I, I won't say that he acquired that title by rejecting his guru, but he acquired the title by his level of, how do you say in English, addition, addition, like to be ad adhere, adhere to? Adherence. Adherence, adherence to truth. No, that it, as a byproduct that took the form of rejecting Sukracharya. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was a byproduct. No? The main, the, the Swarup Lakshan, the main quality was adherence to truth. Oh, he's a Mahajan. He's a Mahajan. And he will say, he said in previous verses things like that. No, he was an example of adherence to truthfulness. He said, There's nothing more sinful than going against truthfulness. No? And truthfulness is the most sinful thing, he will say. Now, remember, we have one of our four regulative principles, which is not, not going to the casino, <laughs> but <laughs> adherence to truthfulness, as Bali Maharaj is showing. Let's put the bar high yeah. so we don't take it cheaply. I'm following that reg. I don't, I'm not gambling. That's it. No, 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 no. Here you have what does it mean to follow the reg? <laughs> no, he knows in one sense I'm losing everything by adherence to truth. But of course, if I remain adherent to truth, I'm not losing anything. No. So I'm willing to lose everything except truth, my adherence to truth. And if my breaking my bow, bow to truth i'm winning everything i don't want that christ will say better you lose the world but gain your soul basically so that's the same principle here no? bali will say in the bottom verses before this one i don't fear anything in this world except for untruthfulness no? try to imagine so, such a degree of integrity and commitment <laughs> No, I don't fear anything. I mean, we fear so many things, <laughs> except for untruthfulness sometimes. <laughs> no, I don't have fear of lying and being hypocrite and dualistic and being like, mm, 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 whitewash reality and know that I could do this, but I'm not doing and complacency and mediocrity. And we don't have fear of that. We are comfortable in that. We delight in <laughs> mediocrity sometimes. <laughs> but we fear so many other things. Mm -hmm. Probably because of that. We fear many other things because we don't fear untruthfulness. <laughs> you put the equation like that. 
when you fear untruthfulness, that will make you up high. You won't fear anything else because of your adherence to truth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so basically, uh, Bali Maharaj, sorry, he's saying, I know I'm losing everything here, but I'm not losing my word, you know, my word of honor. My ball. I'm not losing. I'm willing to go to Patala, Rasatala, whichever, Sutala, that was the planet. So one of these hellish planets. It's okay. As long as my bow remains intact, send me whatever you want. I'm going with my truthfulness there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's not hell, basically. That's the idea. If you are such a truthful person, even if you are physically, literally sent to hell, that's heaven. <laughs> so I may go to hell, but I won't betray myself. Basically, that's what Bali Marsh is saying, as we were talking yesterday. There's nothing worse than betraying yourself. So untruthfulness means betraying yourself, going against what you know is true. No, that there's nothing more painful and compromising than that. <laughs> and, and then he will mention some words about oh, by keeping my word, my reputation will be kept and will be known for history. And again, this idea of, that we hear many times in Shasta, there's nothing worse than infamy and one's <laughs> reputation. It's not so much about pratishta, you know, like, oh, you're so attached to, to, to keeping your reputation nice, but basically it's a way of speaking about how powerful, how powerfully uh, the fame of someone remains if you are sticking to truth in every single moment, every single moment. So then Bali Maharaj elaborates on, on charity, because again, he's about to give charity to Bam and Dev and the importance of charity, as Krishna mentions in the Gita also, the importance of giving charity in the right moment at the right place to the proper person. So that requires some discernment. Giving charity is not just give everything to everyone at any moment. It requires criterion. One of the 10 offenses to the name is to give to someone who has no proper faith also. So there, there is always a, a discernment in terms of giving. We were talking the other day on Jiba Dai be merciful to others, but you have to know how to be merciful to every. You can give charity or be, express compassion to someone in a way that the person does kind of take advantage of that compassion and may be confused or even damaged by your compassion. That can happen also. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So anyhow, Bali Maharaj, before reaching the verses, acknowledging in the previous verses, I know this is Vishnu, Bhagavan, masked coming to me he's not naive he knows what's going on <laughs> but he said i'm willing to i already made a promise no, i cannot go again against again go against my word uh, so that's when sukracharya curses bali maharaj he, you know, so he does not only reject his guru mm -hmm. but his guru doesn't like that at all <laughs> so he curses his disciple no, you will lose everything he will lose everything again except for Except for everything. <laughs> <laughs> no, he will attain prayer. He will attain Krishna. So well, as we were talking the other day, he will become a kinchana, which means totally materially exhausted in, in Prabhupada's terms. But a ah, kinchana also means he whose only possession is a, ah, a, which is Krishna. So you lose everything except for Krishna. That's that's Krishna's treatment. No? Just Yahama, Nugri, Nami, no? that is she, that had, how is the verse? To that person who I want to show extreme mercy, I gradually deprive them of everything. At, at least he says shanai, which means gradually. <laughs> What's gradual for him may not gradual for us, but we should bear in mind that's still gradual. <laughs> I feel I'm being ripped off brutally here, but no, no, that's a gradual treatment by Bhagavan. No? To give himself to me. And what that's he needs to do to give himself to me for, to be for, for me to be prepared to accept that's another thing. So Sukracharya curses Bali Maharaj. Try to imagine your your guru is cursing you. That's not what you expect. No? So it's cursed by him, but nonetheless, Bali Maharaj will attain all success. Why? Because the guru was cursing from a non-guru position. Right. It was not cursing with the, with the right reasons, basically. Bali did not do anything to be cursed. He didn't deserve a curse. So the curse is not having, it's not being an obstacle in his attaining the goal of life. No, a similar section will come in 
in the ninth canto of the Bhagavatam, the story of Prishadra. Uh, and, and in, in brief words, is his at one point he's put to take care of a cow, and accidentally in the darkness he ends up killing the cow mm. unintentionally. Mm. So eventually his guru Basista cursed him. Mm. Like not a similar situation. But Prishadra did that unintentionally and sincerely continued his practice and Bhagavatam described he attained the goal of life. So the point here is if your guru curses you or rejects you for the wrong reasons, you can still attain the goal of life. That section gives me some hope person. <laughs> no? So anyhow, so in this way, Bali Maharaj is prepared to give charity to Bhavan Dev. He washes first the feet of Bhavan Dev, mm. assisted by Bin Diabali, Bali's wife, and then comes by, by his determination of keeping his word, all the devas and then celestial beings do push Babushek. They send flower petals from heaven, praising like Bali Maharaj's like Nishta, so to say. No, they are pleased by his non duplicitous mm -hmm. attitude, the Bhatanis say, you know, because the Bhatan is all about that. Dharma praito kaita bo. We don't want hypocrites in this book. No? So it will be like all about this. So then we find we find ourselves in today's verse. Sorry for the not so short, not so introductory introduction. So I'll read the verse. It's verse uh, 21, chapter 20, per chap canto 8. It says, Tad bhama nam rupam abhardhat tad bhutam. So Srila Prabhupada translates the verse in, as follows. <clears throat> the unlimited supreme personality of Godhead, who had assumed the form of Bhamana, then began increasing his, in size, acting in terms of the material energy, until everything in the universe was within his body, including the earth, the planetary systems, the sky, the directions, the various holes in the universe, the seas, the oceans, the birds, beasts, human beings, the demigods, and the great saintly persons. So Purport says like this, <clears throat> Bali Maharaj wanted to give charity to Bhaman Dev. But the Lord expanded his body in such a way that he showed Bali Maharaj that everything in the universe is already in his body. Mm -hmm. So what to give? <laughs> Actually, no one can give anything to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, for he's full in everything. Sometimes we see a devotee offering Gan Ganges water to the Ganges. After taking his bath in the Ganges, the devotee takes a palmful of water and offers it back to the Ganges. Actually, when one takes a palmful of water from the Ganges, the Ganges does not lose anything. And similarly, if a devotee offers a palmful of water to the Ganges, the Ganges does not increase in any way. But by such an offering, the devotee becomes celebrated as a devotee of Mother Ganges. Similarly, when we offer anything with devotion and faith, what we offer does not belong to us, nor does it enrich the opulence of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But if one offers whatever he has in his possession, he becomes a recognized devotee. In this regard, the example is given that when one's face is decorated with a garland and sandalwood pulp, the reflection of one's face in a mirror automatically becomes beautiful. The original source of everything is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is our original source also. Therefore, when the Supreme Personality of Godhead is decorated, the devotees and all living entities are decorated automatically. Mm -hmm. So, verse 21. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the verse refers again to Bhaman Dev and at the same time <clears throat> to him as Ananta. So he starts to present this like kind of paradoxical connection. He's Ananta limited. But he's a dwarf. <laughs> he's an unlimited dwarf. <laughs> no? And that's why immediately where Adbhutam is mentioned. Adbhutam means like astonishing. Mm -hmm. no? How can you reconcile someone being an unlimited dwarf? 
Mm. So all these paradoxes coexist simultaneously mm, in, in the Supreme Lord, and we have to, again, become accustomed to coexist with, with paradox. I mentioned that in my book on radical personalism, because sometimes we, we don't want to deal with paradox. It's too unsettling. And we want like, okay, is he a dwarf or is he unlimited? No, <laughs> both at the same time. And it's like, okay. <laughs> and another, another interesting paradox is mentioned here, which is, okay, everything is inside the body of God. God is inside of everything. Everything is inside of God. I mean, to, to really grasp this truth, you really need to, or we really need to, sorry, I have to include myself in the equation for sure. <laughs> we really need to, to learn to see things from another place, basically. No? And the Bhagavatam is constantly inviting us to do so. Everything is inside the body of God. God is inside of everything. Just try to pause for a moment and, and enter into that meditation. That's, that's technically called panentheism. Panentheism. Not pantheism, but panentheism, which means everything in God. Pan, everything in, in theism, theos, God. This is not pantheism and this is not theism. This is panentheism. And that's another way of saying achintya veda veda tattva, basically. Everything is one and different from God. God is in everything, everything is in God. Pantheism means the world is God. So by saying the world is God, somehow you start to worship the world as God, literally, and you will take care of the world. So we win back the world. Now we are losing the world. <laughs> Now we're losing the world and there is a big ecological crisis. And I will say one of the main reasons is certain forms of theism, theism which posit God over there above the clouds mm -hmm. and posit this world as completely profane and disconnected from a divine source. Mm -hmm. So that makes us see this world in non-sacred terms. And then we have the ecological crisis we have. No? All that due to theism, <laughs> certain form of it. No, where God is transcendent but not immanent. God is very far in some future time instead of being right here, right now. And for us, God is both transcendent and immanent at the same time. So pantheism, theism, that type of classical theism is God is there and the world is here and there's a huge gap between the two. So the sacred is about the clouds and whatever has to do with dirt and mud is profane. Mm -hmm. As I, I quote uh, one author in my book, she says, there are no, um, Simon, Simon Whale, she says, there are no, there are only sacred things and desecrated things. Mm -hmm. There are no profane things. Mm -hmm. Everything is sacred, but if you don't have the proper vision, you will desecrate mm -hmm. the sacred, but nothing is profane. Because as we mentioned the other day, I mean, Sure, the exhibition is in every atom <laughs> to begin with. <laughs> Establish that foundation. How you can see something as profane. But some tendency of classical theism will create this gap, this abyss. So we have this huge ecological crisis. Pantheism is, okay, no. the classical theism is we win God, but we lose the world. <laughs> Pantheism is we win the world back, but we lose God as a separate person. The, God became the world. And panentheism is our ideal synthesis with when well, we don't lose any of the two. Mm -hmm. uh, because God is in everything and everything is in God. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Jiva Goswami mentions that in, in, in the Bhagavad Sandarbha also. He's describing how the form of Bhagavan is all pervasive. Mm -hmm. so, and he's not saying Paramatma in, the, in that case. Because you can say, okay, that's Paramatma everywhere, all present, every atom, every heart. He's a Bhagavan's form. It's because Paramatma is just a, a level of approach to the ultimate form of the Absolute, which is Bhagavan. Jiva right. Goswami makes that point many, very clear many times in the Bhagavad Sandarbha, especially, which Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagavan, just in case, to clarify, are not three different people. No. They are not three really separate guys, so to say. <laughs> there are three levels of approaching the same non-dual reality. 
So Brahma and Paramatma Bhagavan are not three different entities. Ram, Nishrim, Kabam, and Gaur Hari are not different people. Sometimes we, we are pretty polytheistic in that sense. <laughs> okay, today is Ram Navami, Jayashri, today is Brahman Dwal, but some in our internal conception, we are not seeing they are the same person. <laughs> so we, we end up being polytheistic in the name of monotheism. <laughs> so it's very important to have this non-dual foundation. You know, the other day, Jai Jai and I was mentioning that. I, 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 I wrote a whole chapter in my book about non-dual thinking. And for some, it sounds like, mm, this sounds like impersonalism, non-dual thinking. No, no, our tradition is non-dual. It's not radically non-dual like Advaita Vedanta, but it's non-dual in, in its own way, nuanced non-dualism, so to say. So, so Brahman, Paramatma, Bhagavan, Jiva Goswami says are three levels of approach of the same reality. It's like I, I give, like to give the example of if you are in the maybe you don't have this here in Ypsiland, in the subway. But you know what the subway is, mm -hmm. okay? Just <laughs> to keep the, the example. That's why John likes it. Like <laughs> <laughs> New York, there are lots of subways. Yeah, I've been there. <laughs> A separate, yeah, planetary system, sub subterranean planetary. Another level of Tala Tala Rasa. <laughs> subway Tala we have there. Yeah. So if you are there and you are waiting for the subway and you look into the tunnel, at one point, you first thing you will see is light. That's the subway, but you just perceive the light aspect of that because of the distance. Eventually, it gets closer. You see the, I say the cart, the wagon, whatever, sure. whatever. Okay, <laughs> so that's another level of approach to the same subway reality. But eventually, the doors open and you find, oh, there is people inside. There are interaction. There is individuality. That's also part of the subway. I mean, ideally, <laughs> probably sometimes it's just like. Yeah. Automatons go into the whatever. <laughs> That's another topic. But the point is those three realities, the light, the wagon, the tube, and the inter living interactions inside, all of the three are the same subway thing. But in the beginning, you just saw light. Mm -hmm. So Brahman, Paramatma, and Bhagavan. Bhagavan is the ultimate interaction, individual interaction, personality that allows all that. So, so my point is that <coughs> Jiva Goswami makes it this idea in the Bhagavad Sandarbha. Bhagavan's form, which includes Brahman and Paramatma, again, is the same non-dual reality, is all-pervading. So technically speaking, Bhagavan is everywhere. Mm. <laughs> no? So he is in everything and everything is in him. That's panentheism. You can just stay, I mean, for a while with that idea. God is in everything and everything is in him. All ancient wisdom traditions teach this from the beginning. Teach us, us teach us as children, like learn to see God in the world and, and, and everything is sacred. I mean, unfortunately, some of us did not have that deep education and like treating the world as God being present there in one way. It's, I mean, it's, in one sense, it's God from the Chinta Bed Aved equation. Bed means difference, but Aved means non-difference. So in one sense, everything is God. And we can say Sarbak, Kalu, Vidam, Brahma, it's okay. No? <laughs> For some reason, that's in the Vedas. <laughs> everything is the absolute. And yet, we have the Veda side of the equation that adds nuance and diversity and allows for individual loving interaction. But on another level, nothing is separate from God. In that sense, everything is God. He's in everything. Everything is in Him. That's that's something that even like quantum physics discovered. Like everything is completely interconnected. There is nothing that is disconnected from everything else. That's that's chamatkar. That's astonishment. You you can be the whole day just like <laughs> contemplating this idea. Everything is connected with everything. Everything has a relationship with everything because everything shares a common center. Some bandha. Everything is. Full is some, everything is bandha, is tied with Krishna in the center, revolving around. Nothing is isolated from the center. So we should relate and treat everything with that in mind. 
everything is a, a unit of interconnectedness <laughs> with Krishna in the center. Mm. So panentheism is that. Krishna is in everything. Everything is in Krishna. Mm. There are different lilas in the Bhagavatam that portray this reality beautifully. One of them being the famous lila where Krishna is eating dirt, mm -hmm. or at least he's accused of being so, being having done so. Mm. Do you believe the accusation was true or not? Krishna is such a nice guy. He won't do that stuff, right? Probably it's a false accusation. No, who knows? <laughs> At least Krishna presents that case. No, when Krishna's friends come to your shoulder and start to bring the accusation to the table, Krishna said, "I haven't done that. No, I mean, these guys are envious of me <laughs> because I always defeat them in daily wrestling, which is another lie." <laughs> he generally loses when fight western with three down and so on he generally Krishna's the loser he's not the winner right? that's an interesting idea also that's another layer of discussion <laughs> so there are lay layers upon layers of untruthfulness in the context of Bali Maharaj's truthfulness <laughs> so all this is preparing us to deal with Krishna's untruthfulness in the Lila so we can really appreciate for what it is and don't get misled first you go through a thick layer of truthfulness personified with Bali Maharaj so Krishna will say, I didn't do anything. These guys are accusing me falsely because they are angry and envious that I defeat them on a daily basis on wrestling. And these guys, the first Krishna Sakas are like, that's not true either. I mean, we are defeating you on, oh, we are defeating you on a daily basis and you ate dirt. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, show this like in the midst of this dynamic, say, open the open your mouth. Let's let's check. Let's go to, <laughs> let's, let's invoke Pratyaksha here. Now a direct experience. Let's go to the facts. The, mm. the hard facts <laughs> open the, the, the mouth and okay okay she was she thought he he ate he ate some dirt or how to say dirt dirt, dirt. Yeah. so krishna opened the mouth and then just showed us saw some pretty amount of dirt there you no know? that's technically speaking she saw the whole planet earth there <laughs> 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 So she saw the world in Krishna. But when she looked further, she saw inside that world, inside Krishna, was Krishna. Mm -hmm. Krishna was inside the world that was inside Krishna. And she was looking at Krishna's mouth inside that world that was inside Krishna. And inside that world that was inside Krishna, she was looking at was another world. <laughs> was, and so on and so forth. Like this, like, how do you say? I think they call it Petrushka. These Petrushka dolls uh -huh. in Europe, there is one doll, you open, there's another doll, you open, there's another yeah. doll, you open, there's like some <laughs> kaleidoscopical, yeah? So Yashoda was like, whoa, what's going on here? But that Lila is establishing this panentheistic point. No? <laughs> she saw the world in Krishna, but Krishna was inside the world she was, no? She was looking at Krishna's mother. Krishna mm -hmm. was localized inside planet Earth, but inside Krishna was planet Earth as well. So it was inside and outside. There are plenty of verses in the Bhagavatam establishing this fact. I won't torture you now with that. I, I did that torture chamber in the last chapter of my book. I put <laughs> verse after verse after verse. Of, because in the last chapter of my book, it's called Unearth in Heaven. I use the play of words, no? Unearth in Heaven. So try to discover heaven here. In other words, try to learn. We have to learn to see the world of matter as sacred, not as profane, not as a place to reject and leave as soon as possible. And there are so many verses in the Bhagavatam that, that show this point, you know, how Krishna is fully present in the world, how everything is connected to him, how everything is inside of him, he's inside of everything, so there's no need to reject anything. <laughs> Sometimes we, we wrongly conceive... Um, <clears throat> transcendence is rejection. No, I have transcended that, no, which means I discarded that, I, I rejected that. But that's not transcendence. Probably that's evasiveness. Transcendence means integration, at least for me, integration of complexity. There's so much complexity that is unintegrated in our life and it's like here and how to make all of that part of a higher synthesis. No, that's transcendence. Everything is made, everything is Nothing is rejectable. Nothing is, how does it in English, disposable. Yeah. Because everything is Krishna's Shakti, Krishna's energy. So why 
why the need to reject anything? No? Like I was saying, quoting the other day, what Prabhupada said to one devotee who told him, I'm willing to reject everything for you. And he said, the only thing you need to reject is the idea that you have to reject something. <laughs> Yukta Vairagya means that. Everything is potential paraphernalia to be offered in the service of Krishna. So nothing to reject. No? The, the arati plate that we offer to Gornitai daily includes all this paraphernalia, incense, lamp, but all this symbolizes the Maha, Pancha Mahaput, you know, the earth, water, fire, either, all these basic elements which constitute these creations. So this plate represents this whole creation. So what do you do with this whole creation? You offer that to Krishna and then you receive the, the remnants of that. You don't take the plate and you do self-puja. <laughs> no? <laughs> no? So by, by doing that sacred act, you are linking I mean, already it's linked. Matter is already linked to, Maha, to to Bhagavan, but we don't have that link established in our own mind and heart, so we need to do that. You know, like Prabhupada is saying here in the purport, when I mean, you offer something to Bhagavan, it already belongs to him. No? It's not that, oh, I'm giving you a, this gift that didn't belong to you before my offering. It was already, you already belonged to him. But by doing that, you are entering to that space where you become aware of, oh, Hmm. I mean, in one sense, what you are given to Bhagavan is secondary. The main thing is your, the giving of yourself. And that's why in the Bhagavad Gita, when you have the verses 26 and 27, the ninth chapter, Patram Pushpam, Palam Toyam, Anjat Karosi, Yadas Nasi, the, the second one is considered inferior to the first. Because in the second one, Krishna is saying, whatever you do, whatever you offer, whatever austerities you perform, and so on, do that as an offering to me. So that verse is establishing, do something and then offer it, offer that to Krishna. While the previous verse implies Sudha Bhakti, which means offer yourself to Krishna and then do something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you follow? There's a difference there. I do something and then I offer that to Krishna. I offer myself to Krishna. I am the offering. <laughs> and then I do anything. Not anything, but whatever is prescribed after myself offering to him. And whatever I do is prashat, basically. Mm -hmm. Because I'm already prashat. I already, I'm the offering. Mm -hmm. I'm the saha. Uh -huh. The grain is not meant to go into the, the, the grain is represent, the grain of rice is symbolizing yourself entering to the fire. Maybe not too practical to literally enter into the fire. <laughs> so we threw the grain. But the swaha is I'm offering myself to you. Mm -hmm. So... So anyhow, I'm, I'm going to different directions, but in connection to this topic. So, so just to, to conclude, in, and in case there is any question, uh, this verse, again, very interestingly mentions that. You know, in this verse, it's mentioned, okay, everything was inside Bhavan Dev's body. His body started to increase, and the earth was in him, the sky was in him, the planetary system were in the body of him. And, and, and the next series of verses that we will see tomorrow will start to depict the Virab Rupa Darshan, like the vision of the universal form, which happens many times in the Bhagavatam, as well as in the Gita. So it's, that's a very interesting idea and, and, and reason why this, this point is mentioned. Actually, the Virab Rupa, first time Virab Rupa is invoked, is basically when Sukadev Goswami is replying to Orixit Mars, the very first thing that he says is Virab Rupa which we will say is not the goal of life, but at the same time, it's a very immediate foundation that we need to have in place. Virat Rupa means see this whole world as a form of God. Mm -hmm. Learn to see the world, the different phenomena and manifestations in connection with him. Try to have that as a preliminary foundation. And then we can go to speak about Braja Lila and so many other things, but <coughs> first things first, so to say. Mm -hmm. Uh, because, again, the goal of life, when you become an Uttam Bhagavat, as we quoted these days, Gita says, Jomam Pasyati Sarvatra Sarvam Chamai Pasyati, and so on. Krishna says, he who sees me in everything and sees everything in me, Panentheism, <laughs> I'm never lost to him, he's never lost to me. Mm -hmm. That's the vision of the highest entity. So we need to, to reach there. And that ultimate vision has to do with this panentheistic perspective. Everything is in God. God is in everything. I, maybe I do not see everything in that way now, but at least I have to be 
educated in theory that such is how actual reality is to be appreciated. <laughs> I'm not saying it now. Someone may say, Marsh, all the things you're talking pertain to the Uttam Bhagavat. So we are not Uttam Bhagavat. We don't see reality as such. We are being Sahaja. We are imitating. No, we are not imitating. We are just <laughs> becoming aware, educated, how reality should be looked upon in the ideal condition. And, and by contrast and comparison, how far or close I am from that vision now, what I'm seeing now, how much I'm seeing the presence of God in the world, as we said the other day. The Kanishta will see God is in the altar. Stop. Out, now the curtains are closed. God disappeared. No, there is no God. God is hiding behind the curtain. That's it. I don't see God anywhere else, nor in you, nor in... Every atom, nothing, only in that particular, hyper localized. Mm -hmm. no? Kanishta vision is hyper localizing God. The Madhyam vision, intermediate vision is okay, God is behind the curtain, but God is also in, in your heart. Mm -hmm. And the Uttam vision is again, Yuman Pasyat, God is everywhere and everywhere, everything and everything is in God, where God is not. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no? Prahlad Maharaj's vision. That's interesting. Prahlad had that vision, as we remember. Oh, God is in the pillar. Mm -hmm. And he literally appeared from the pillar. That's an important point. And Shrinkadev came to confirm this panentheistic perspective. <laughs> now Prahlad said, God is in the pillar. <clears throat> literally? Yeah, literally. <laughs> and the pillar was this size, and Shrinkadev was this size, but somehow he managed to appear from the pillar. Confirm. If you have the eye to see the 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 the, the premanjan and chirita bhakti vilochnena, your eyes are tinged with the self of love. Bhagavan may appear from mm -hmm. from anywhere. So watch out. <laughs> 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 so Prahlad has such vision, and Bali Maharaj is Prahlad's grandson. So somehow is yeah. he has inher inherited. Inherent or inherited? He has inherited <laughs> some subliminal promotion there. <laughs> he has inherited that type of some scars of vision of seeing, seeing God everywhere. And now he's having that darshan himself now. And then Bhaman Dev yeah. is showing everything is in me, me, I am in everything. And he's witnessing such, a, such yeah. an event. So, yeah, tomorrow we'll see how this continues unfolding in the form of. A more detailed explanation of what's inside that body and this Viradrupa Darshan. Mm -hmm. So it's almost nine. I don't know if we have a few minutes if anyone has any question. In the present one, <laughs> we will give priority to the physically present and then someone here on Zoom also will like. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Thank you. We're not like Michelangelo's <laughs> painting. We, we, we did our best to... Sometimes the, you were describing that the vision, the theism, without that pen and theism, can lead like to a sort of desecration of the world. You see it as profane. <clears throat> but Prabhupada also speaks the idea of seeing the world, everything in the world as God or as Brahman, like the radical <clears throat> non dualist, can also lead to another form <clears throat> of desecration where they're a very expert at enjoying the world. Because oh everything was God and of course I'm embracing God at every step. God at every step. <laughs> you know, for any of us who went to like rainbow <laughs> gathers and so on, that was like a very common conception mm. that the world is um everything is God and then they would embrace the world for their own enjoyment. And Prabhupada's criticized that a lot is like another form of desecration. Mm -hmm. So then the question comes, <clears throat> how does one accommodate this non dualistic vision? Um Actually, everything, in fact, indeed, is a God. He's mm -hmm. in it. He is it. Essentially, he's the basis for it. <clears throat> but establish a relationship that doesn't actually desecrate. Yeah. So I think you you you, you gave us the hint to reply at the, at the very end when you say establish a relationship. Because, yeah, we go to the, <coughs> to the non-dual side of the equation. I bet everything is God. So party is starting right now, no? <laughs> but at the same time, the beta side of the equation is everything is not God in the sense of there's the relationship principle. So there is God and there's the energies of God. And I'm one energy and the world is one energy and there's a relationship and the relationship is always based on service. 
So, so for us, this beta side of the equation is preventing from this type of exploitative non-dualism, so to say, where everything is God and let's just like, and I'm God also, so I'm just enjoying myself, no? so mm. to say, because I imagine they may say things like that. They do. No? <laughs> everything is God and I'm God, so I'm just oh, having Lila. fun with myself. Mm -hmm. No, it's Lila. Lila, that's Lila. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So then, of course, we establish this everything is God in some particular context, and which, which contextualize, I would say the Veda side contextualize the Abeda side for us, mm -hmm. Gaudius. So the Veda same is everything is God in the sense that everything is an inseparable energy of the divine, and all these energies are relating to one another in terms of service to the common center. So then comes the idea of service and then comes the sacralization of everything because everything is to be related at from a sacred perspective of, of Seva. No? So, so then we, the, I will say the Veda side prevents from this non-dual uh, rainbow exploitation. <laughs> yeah, then we'll... Uh, it's very poignant for me, Maharaj, that you're speaking from this section. Um, you told me to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> Just following orders here. Many years ago, we were anchored to a, a sequential speaking on the Bhagavatam verses rather than hopping around to wherever we felt like speaking from. And it's always sweet to see how Krishna arranges around that for certain people to speak on certain topics, certain days. So. Very poignant for me because last year, one of the main takeaways from the conversation you stirred up in the Gaudi community with your first book was this sanctity of the so-called mundane, the, the unbecoming material energy that we're also used to hating as a way of expressing love for Krishna. So I, I really appreciate um, how you brought that in. And then today, of course, the, the verse was just directly, uh, you know. A, yeah. Bhagavatam substantiation of that still on the other side and then what you went through the last year between your visit to us is also very poignant for the, the theme of the discussion as well the Leela itself but I wonder then where do we contextualize it's essentially what Jai said but taking it a step further with places in the Bhagavatam where there's a kind of repugnance towards the material energy, especially expre expressed by exemplars, a kind of repugnance, I spit on it. <laughs> Where does that fit into this when, when we encounter those statements from people we're otherwise heralding? How to integrate that? Yeah, yeah, great question. Thanks so much. Uh, which again brings us back to to these different statements in scripture and how to harmonize them as we talk these days. There are statements like that so you have to know what to do with that no. even Prabhupada sometimes may say I don't want to go in that direction but you fall from Vaikuntha it is a fact that nobody falls from Vaikuntha <laughs> you have to do something with that you cannot just cherry, engage in cherry picking it doesn't work like that Rupa Goswami makes that clear in Lago Bhagavatam the way to, uh, to harmonize statements, contradictory statements is not cherry picking favorite sections that are more comfortable for my situation but you have to understand the context and why and so on so so yeah i addressed that in my in the last chapter of my book again on earth in heaven that's the longest chapter of the whole book i don't know why but it's because maybe probably it's a very important theme for me like we need to like <clears throat> how to say reclaim our relationship with matter from a from a healthy holistic sacred place mm -hmm. because if not our practice may be very pretty dysfunctional because this idea of matter is corrupt ontologically <laughs> extends itself to the form of the body is bad emotions are bad mm -hmm. feelings are bad grihastha are bad. ashram is bad family life is bad sexual life is bad other people everything is bad no, <laughs> basically, <laughs> except with chanting my job and something else. But from which place you are chanting japa with it's also bad. It's also bad. Yeah, at the end of the day, it's like, <laughs> yeah. but all these bads stem from this idea of 
matter is bad, probably, not from this misconception, <clears throat> the world is bad. So whatever is spring from that world. Mm. No. Uh, and yeah, there are state Christians in, in, in the Gita saying, Do Kalayama Sashrotam. No. He said, This world is miserable and temporary. And we're like, Okay, welcome. <laughs> 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 but then you have Prabhupada Nanda Saraswati saying, Vishram Purnan Sukhayate. Mm. The whole universe is an abode of joy. So you're like, Hmm, <laughs> miserable and temporary, an abode of joy. No. Should I cherry pick or should just I understand from which perspective this is being talked about? So again, when we have these statements in Shastra, the world is bad or is miserable or and so on and so forth. Actually, that means that's spoken to those who are seeing this world with an eye of exploitation mm -hmm. to the rainbow gatherers, basically. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, ah, let's show you here. This is no, if you want to, to exploit matter, they will use that harsh word like preventing, like. No, actually, no, it's not that the world is bad. It's wor the world is miserable. Your approach to matter is, mm -hmm. is miserable in the sense of it will be begot, you say? Beget. Beget misery as, as, as the result. Mm -hmm. But if you approach matter from a sacred perspective, that's completely different. Mm -hmm. So so I will say most, just to make it short, that, that's basically the, the background. No, Like, like I, I gave the example in my book, like if, a, if the mother knows the child wants to put the, open this and put the <laughs> finger in the cables with water on his hand on top of that. No? And the mother knows he wants to do that. He wants to do that. The more I tell him not to do it, the more he wants to do that, of course. <laughs> so she will probably resort to the language like, there's a monster there. Mm -hmm. No, <laughs> don't put your hand that. The plug is bad. <laughs> My mom had it. <laughs> I cannot repeat this that publicly. No, I'm, I'm live on Zoom here. I cannot repeat that. No, so the plug will bite you, has something against you. So the child says, okay. okay. So that's the language for that stage. Eventually you understand and you don't need to use that to resort to that language. So sometimes Shastra also employs, because Shastra is speaking to different people from different situations. So it will use certain language. But for other people, it will use another language. And you need to understand that when going through Shastra to find your language, so to say, the language that refers to your particular stage. No? So, yeah, because so Ma Ma Maya Shakti, another section I was sharing in, in Anam Rasa's house, I, I, I gave a lecture on, on, I would like to share a particular quote. I have a minute? Of course. Okay, we have eternity on our side still. <laughs> so <Right>. there is... <laughs> what, what do you say? Especially oh yeah <laughs> go the timing yeah uh where it is here so this is a, a this is a firm, there's a famous verse in the bhagavatam which is bhagavatam to let's read the verse also and this is very nice verse i always liked a lot it says like this <clears throat> The lord's activities in association with his different energies should, should be described no sorry yeah, <coughs> the Lord's activity, specifically speaking about Maya, Maya. So the Lord's activities in association with, in connection to Maya, should be described, appreciated, and heard in accordance with the teachings of the Supreme Lord. If this is done regularly with devotion and respect, one is sure to get out of the illusory energy of the illusory situation. So this verse is encouraging that you hear Bhagavan's interaction with Maya Shakti. By going through that, you will be rid of Maya. Now, and Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur comments on this verse. Say, one should have faith that the material energy is a devotee with the greatest devotion. And therefore, a devotee should hear about such a devotee. <laughs> Since the Lord's Leela in relation to Maya is not Maya. <laughs> no? Instead, it is something transcendental. <clears throat> so in other words, Maya, material energy, is a Vaishnavi with the highest bhakti. So if you mistreat matter, you are mistreating a Vaishnavi. Vaishnavi. It will be a form of Vaishnavi apara, basically. So, anyhow, some thoughts in connection to what you mentioned. Yeah, <clears throat> the two of, yeah. This, I, I just want to throw yeah, yeah. the 
when I looked into this fall bond, which right or wrong, it, it means less now than what is its implications for our community. It's observed even within the Christian community that the idea of falling from heaven wasn't originally there. It mm -hmm. came in later. Yeah. And when it, when it came in was the time in which the Christian community began to take on its, uh, what is today now, it's very repugnant and edginess towards everybody else. That everyone else has fallen and sinful and damned, and only we are good. And unless you're on our side, everything about this world is just uh, throwaway, disposable. Mm -hmm. And so the culture of Christianity doesn't bring people even to simple things like vegetarianism, even though it's so obviously mm -hmm. against the will of any kind of divine being to eat meat. Mm -hmm. So the way in you pointed it out, Maj, but it, the way in which our communities through philosophy, I've been able to dismiss the need to take care of our family, take care of our people, take care of our property uh, in the name of transcendence is connected to this idea of the fall and how this place in itself is a, a condemned one. And so I don't really need to give it any attention. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one big little word in, in, in defense of Christianity. <laughs> <laughs> Because well, original Christianity didn't have that idea, which is interesting. Yeah, and, and many contemporary Christian <clears throat> mystics are also acknowledging that and, and, and emphasizing that we are not like, uh, they are not emphasizing this idea of original sin mm -hmm. in connection to this, but of original blessing. Mm -hmm. no? and, and they try to pound that post because there is so much of this original sin neurosis in connection which to the falling. <laughs> exactly, exactly. It's not original. Yeah. Okay. But but original blessing, no? like from day one or another time, however you want to put it, there is a blessing, uh, a, a potential blessing embedded in everything, so to say. No? Even even in this world, no? the Vedanta Sutra says, sorry if I go too far, but this may be my favorite sutra from the Vedanta, Loka Vatu Lila Kaivalyam, which basically, according to the explanation of Baladevi, the evolution and so on, implies the, the, the joy of God in the Lila of Krishna in association with his associates in Golok starts to overflow so much and the overflowing of that joy becomes the material creation. Mm -hmm. So the whole this whole material creation is a byproduct of God's ananda in transcendence. So how can you see this world as profane <laughs> if that's such a background? Huh? I del delve into that in detail in that chapter because for me it's like, well, I mean, you kind of miss this part. <laughs> yes. If you could just further nuance, I have another question, on, but just um, so much of the ecstasies of the devotees speaks, appears to at least speak like, not poorly, but in a very renounced way towards their family, towards the material world. And it's not just like a pet, like a, it's not just like teaching, this is like their ecstasy. Yeah expressed mm -hmm. before God and like almost every student has got like a small little section that's just like the, the material, material world is bad you know <laughs> or it appear, appears that way at least but they'll say like if you get sadhu sangha you get the blessing of being like completely detached from your family mm -hmm. from the material energy and it's like stuti after stuti after stuti has that like mm -hmm. ecstasy and so that also I know, when you're hearing it, the ecstasy of the devotees, it's like, oh, well, this seems to be like an important... I can get to that real quick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but then, but then you, you get to the ultimate goal of life, and everyone is living in household life there. <laughs> you get to Golok Brindavan, and there are no monastics there. I no? think... They go to Niti now, and you have Sri Vasanga, Sri Vaspanda. He's Grihasta. Everyone is eternally Grihasta. So you have to... I get your point, of course, but then you have to, okay, see the... The full range of how transcendence plays out in our particular tradition, especially. Yeah. You know, so. And one thing is that about because I was thinking this exactly oh. is that it's not the material energy that's bad. It's our it's our conception of our relationship with the material energy. And I think the reason and this is what I'm thinking because it's easy to say, oh, exploitation is bad, but actually what I'm seeing is that what's more pernicious is like family life and all that as good as in the proper context but there's a preoccupation there can be an over preoccupation with a particular ethic which is actually virtuous but doesn't have christian in the center and i think that's why if someone's truly realized they can genuinely say that but it's not dismissive of the value of family life but at a certain point i feel like 
those things actually in the long run are more pernicious. Like even vegetarianism can be a preoccupation. Like now I'm a particular type of vegan and I go to the temple and all I talk about, I mean, it happens. Like all I talk about is veganism. Like, you know, vegan, vegan, vegan. The word Veda doesn't come out of my mouth. Like, Uh or, you know, there's so many. And I think especially these days, like, there are a lot of preoccupations with virtue, Mm -hmm. but there's not, but what's the, what's the center of that virtue? It's actually in a relationship with Krishna. Speaking about the devotees Bob also, if we think of family life as a kind of vessel to drink divinity from, it's relatively small compared to direct connection with like Harinam or the Bhagavatam, the rest the top of the lord's glories so that vessel can nourish for some time and it's it's always capable of nourishing but when i'm desperate in my connection with god to have a deeper experience then family life no longer satisfies wealth no longer satisfies all the we can say family lives can facilitate kata and hearing yes and so on so in that case it's again anukul no i always like this verse from just to add something to family life because I know there is a deep layer of unresolved trauma and that connection is still like the dark dark well myth is still there. This I like this verse from the Brahma Stuti where Brahma is saying Taba Raga Yashtinas Tabat Kada Griham Griham Tabat Mohangrini Gato Yabat Krishna Natijana. Say and uh, Brahma say until someone becomes your devotee, keep that in mind, <laughs> he will say your material attachment will remain a thief. Your home will remain in prison, and your emotions for other people will remain foot shackles. <laughs> so it seems like oof. But until you become, until someone becomes your devotee, implying when you become a devotee, all those things, home, relationship, feelings, are no longer prison foot shackles, but can even facilitate, mm-hmm. facilitate bhakti. Hmm? I have here one comment. Let me share with from this verse from Bishmanath. I'm concluding. He said. In, the, in that way, the same home, which was formerly a prison cell created by favorable and unfavorable karmic reactions, becomes for a devotee a place filled with service to God by hearing and chanting his glories and a host of other activities meant to please the Absolute. These activities carry one to God's eternal abode. So he's describing the activities in, in, at home can carry you to the spiritual. Bhakti Nathakur and Sharan Agat is saying, I'm, I'm discovering Golok Brindavan in my house. Literally, he's saying, of course, that's Bhakti Nautakur, but he's showing the potential. If you embrace Bhakti properly, Golok is at home, basically. <laughs> if you're using the proper lens. Yeah, you yeah. yeah, because if you say, no, you need to become a monk to attain perfection, that's that's Gyan Karmadi and every There's not Gyan Karmadi and every time. Your conception of Bhakti is mixed with Barna and Ashram. You need to change Barna and Ashram or Ashram to attain Bhakti, a better version of Bhakti. It's like that, you know, Again, so you can attain perfection in bhakti in household life. And as I always put, the ultimate perfection of bhakti will play itself out in household life. <laughs> because nobody in Vrindavan or Nityanavada will be a brahmachari there. <laughs> <laughs> you had a question, Anya, sorry, half an hour ago. Um, Maharaj, I really appreciated how you said... Um, Swaha, offering the rice or mm. the food or whatever we're offering to Krishna is ultimately ourself. Mm-hmm. I've never heard that before, so that was like an aha moment. And I, I just want like practical advice. Um, throughout the day, besides offering food, um, I'm, I'm new to the Krishna path, so forgive me if everyone already knows this answer. But, we're all, um, also new, all new. <laughs> um, never new. Is there any <clears throat> other practice? that you would recommend for that kind of like offering of the self mm-hmm. throughout the day just quick little things or, or long things right now <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, sweet. she rather has some that tip was, that was my question too so that was really sweet. oh that's so sweet, sweet. <laughs> Yeah, I'm very terrible for tips and, and practical style. I'm such an abstract philosopher sorry for that but <laughs> <laughs> but <clears throat> Yeah, <laughs> I mean, I like to think about it. everything we're doing as and as an attempt to do so. So, 
I mean, our 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 moments of Swarup Siddha Bhakti or like concentrated devotional practice like chanting or prayer has a lot to do with with entering into that inner space. Like I am the offering, you know, I offer myself to you. I am you all this main the main anga, the angi, which is called of saranagatis, gopriti varanam, which means you are maintaining me. It's another way of saying the same thing. Rakshi Shatiti Vishwa So, I trust you will protect me and you are maintaining me. You know, I'm being maintained by you. So, so that's a very, very much in the spirit of I'm the offering. I'm giving myself to you. You are sustaining me. So, so I will say trying try to recall these different angas of Sharanagati is very helpful. But <clears throat> Whatever, <clears throat> sorry, whatever it helps each person. Again, it's very, I, I'm not so much friends of, of universal light formulas, so to say, like this is the best way to make yourself an offering to Krishna because that may work for you and that may not work at all for any of the other ones. So try, as we talk with Jay Jagannath in our podcast, we have to craft our own version of bhakti in this sense, like find a way that it works better for you in terms of, Considering, I mean, of course, there are many verses in the scriptures in, in this connection, so one can learn some of them and have them as, as daily meditations, and in which the spirit of I'm offering, giving myself to you, I am the offering itself, uh, can help. I can share some of those later if you want, not to extend overextend now myself, but but whatever it helps. Again, as I told, yeah, we were talking yesterday with Sri Radha, and my reply to her is. is, is if it helps, you can put a sign on the wall of your house, basically. <laughs> I am the offering. Now, I don't know. That can help. <laughs> I know people who does that. <laughs> I visited the boat and I'm like, wow, you have a whole wall house with, with signs. <laughs> and verses. And really? But I like that because you are entering a room like, oh, wow. Every sign is a portal. It's like, oh, wow. Oh, windows to the spiritual world in their own way, you know. So teachers do that. Yeah, whatever, whatever it helps you. you no, know? I know many devotees put verses to memorize in the bathroom. I I don't know if many. I I know I know I know one. I won't say the name, but I know one. No, they put like the verses on the on the mirror of the bathroom, one corner. And I I know one friend of mine. He has like every time I go to the bathroom in his house, he has like a like fifteen pages put one another in the bathroom. So it's like, wow, he's like... <laughs> so every time I enter the bathroom, I know which verse he's memorizing because that's on the front. Mm -hmm. no? So you have something to do in the bathroom. No? So you, <laughs> apart from being in the bathroom. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, some, some thoughts that can, some come to mind. No? Mm -hmm. And of course, be close of those people that you really feel they are they are into that offering space they are really living as as a they are a living offering themselves you no know, to try to to receive the impressions and the influence from, from the con the proximity with those type of people that you find in your life they are really willing to be the offering basically you know? last question because probably it's already too late yeah um it's kind of in reference to what you asked, um, <clears throat> from a really young age, I always was talking to God, and it's funny because Charlie and I were just having this conversation this morning, listening to Wisdom of the Sages, and they were talking about how um, it's like a little child offering back something to their mom, like he was, because he was explaining about how he tried to educate this billionaire on yoga history he's talking about how Bhagavan is everything he's creation all of this and um i immediately recalled at a very young age three or four just constantly talking to god and i remember thinking even at that age that that everything was god that god was everywhere and and i was always talking to him and my mom thought me really strange, was always yelling at me to stop talking. And <laughs> honestly, most people might say I had, you know, personality disorder or something because I was just always, always talking to God. And even as I've grown, I've gone through many different phases of spirituality, religion. And um, at one phase in my life, there was 
this, I was studying the Quaker religion, the, the Quakers and the Shakers are very, you know, devout religious sect of Christianity. Mm -hmm. Christianity. And also there is a vegetarian sect of Christianity. Mm -hmm. There are the Seventh-day so, Adventists. Yes. It was very, they're very Bhakti-like. It's wild. It was good friends with many people. And anyway, um, there's a phrase, a saying that they have, and it's hands to work and hearts to God. And I, I took that to heart for the rest of my life when I came across this, because I'm like, yeah, everything's an offering to God. Everything I do, everything I say, everything I think, everything that I'm doing, even like when I make tea or when I'm doing the laundry or when I'm like, everything that I do is an offering to God if I have the proper mindset. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not even that <coughs> I have to go sweep this floor, but I'm sweeping this floor and I'm doing it for God. Or I'm doing this laundry. God sucks. I'm doing this laundry. And you can be either harassed in your material existence, or you can view everything as an opportunity to serve God. And so I've kind of taken that into even my bhakti path that everything that I'm doing is a potential offering to God. On the converse, it sometimes has <laughs> catastrophic effects on my psyche because I feel so guilty when I don't fall through with that. I feel so ashamed when I'm not. When I think bad thoughts about somebody because they, they upset me or they mm. offended me. I'm like, oh, why mm. am I so offended? And you did not be offended. And, oh, I'm so ashamed that I'm so mm. low. And anyway. <laughs> yeah, thank you. There is even a term for that, what you were describing. One says that Jiva Goswami uses Sangha Siddha Bhakti, which basically means, I mean, he speaks about Swarup Siddha Bhakti. And his Sandharas means activities which are inherently Bhakti. Like Shravan Kirtan, Vishnu Shmaranam, these main angas of bhakti, practice of bhakti, sadhu sangha, bhagavatam, kirtan. That's, that's bhakti. Even if you do it without knowing that's bhakti, that's bhakti and it's having an effect. But there are activities like peeling potatoes, which are not inherently bhakti. It's not that every single person at this precise moment on earth who is peeling a potato is acquiring bhakti samskars. No, that's not going on. <laughs> but peeling potatoes can be bhakti as everything else can be bhakti. So that's what Jiva Goswami calls Sangha Siddha Bhakti. Acti activities that by association reach perfection by becoming bhakti. So you can take a shower, that's not bhakti. But if you are a devotee and you have proper conception and awareness, I'm taking a shower to take care of this sadhakadeha, which is not mine, and which is a gift of my guru to engage in service, this body. So that's bhakti. So your shower has become bhakti. And again, shower, peeling potato, sweeping the floor, potentially everything can be bhakti. But again, we have to have the proper, nice. I don't want to make it cheap also. Uh, everything can be bhakti. Okay, yeah. everything I'm doing is bhakti. Not necessarily. <laughs> as long as you have the proper vision. First, you may need the proper conception and education then through proper practice and assimilation that becomes a vision unto itself. So that naturally, of course, whatever you're doing will be totally enlightened and, and, and sacred at that point. And so the potential is there at least, even if we are a little far from the idea, it's, it's and yeah, it can be neur neurotic, but we have to be careful, but it gives so much hope also. It's so user-friendly. Okay, bhakti can be everything I do from, the moment I wake up to the moment I'm going to sleep, and when I'm advanced, even sleeping will be bhakti. No? So, so anyhow, yeah, watch out for that neurosis. Yeah, that's an important point. <laughs> mm. Okay, I'll stop here because it's 9 30. If there are any other questions, something we can continue talking later tomorrow in, in, in morning class. Srila Prabhupada ki jai, Sri Sri Gaur Nityananda ki jai, Sri Harinam Sankirtan ki jai, Gaur Bhakta Vrinda ki jai, Gaur Primananda Hari Gaur, Vancha Kalpata Rubya Shakri Pasindu Vyeva Chapati Tanam Pavani Vyo Vaishnavi Vyunamo, Ananta Koti Vaishnavi Vrinda ki jai, Gaur Hari Gaur.